And so we'll just share it out right afterward. Uh, so uh, the world will still get it today, uh, just a little bit later. Um, so let's get started. Um, all right, welcome uh, to uh, Opus Trainings. Uh, I think we're at our fifth fireside chat of 2021. Um, I'm so excited to have uh, these three panelists here uh, to chat about uh, the labor challenges that we're seeing in the hospitality industry today. My name is Rachel Nemeth. I'm the CEO of Opus Training. Um, I will talk a little bit more about Opus in a moment, um, but I would actually like to start by introducing our panelists. Um, so uh, we have with us today uh, Alice Cheng, who is the founder and CEO of Culinary Agents. I'm going to let Alice introduce herself. Uh, we also have Firas Luwadi, who is the COO of Hospitality Capital Partners. And we also have Jackie McMahon Oliveri, who is the Director of Talent and Culture for Bobby Flay's Restaurant Group, supporting all of Bobby Flay's restaurants. Um, Alice, I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit, and then we're going to toss it over to Firas and then Jackie. Great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, yep, I'm Alice Chang, founder and CEO of Culinary Agents, which is a job marketing applicant management tool dedicated for the hospitality industry. Um, we focus on restaurants, hotels, food service, um, anything related to hospitality. And we're uh, very um, excited to talk about this topic. <laughs> so looking forward to it. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for coming, Alice. Firas, off to you. Hey, so thanks for having me. Uh, this is for us. I uh, currently am the CEO of Hospitality Capital Partners. Um, which uh, operates a few brands, uh, namely uh, My Ceviche and Zook, uh, known brands here in Miami, considered local heroes. A little bit about myself. I've been in the restaurant industry for the past 21 years since I uh, immigrated here from North Africa. That's all I've been doing. Um, been a crew member for a very, very long time and uh, still a crew member at heart. Every time I visit the restaurants, that's what I do. Um, and I'm excited about this chat because, uh, you know, I want to learn and uh, very excited to hear what uh, my fellow panelists have to say about the, the subject. Thanks for being here, Firas. Jackie? I unmuted. I'm Jackie mcmahon Oliveri. Like Rachel said, it is, it is great to be here. I'm currently supporting Bobby Flay restaurants and like everyone else, you know, COVID just changed everything that we've been doing, but at the heart of it, I've been doing recruiting and talent management and acquisition for over 20 years. And it's just part of the roller coaster, right? The trials and tribulations are always there. I'm also the president of HRPIH, which is human resource professionals in hospitality. And we had our monthly meeting this morning and uh, there are about 15 of us on the call and, you know, a hundred at large and everyone is, is, talking about this topic for sure. Um, it's great to meet Firas. I, I look forward to getting to know you both Rachel and Alice. I have compliments for you today because on our monthly meeting, I mentioned the both of you and so many people were talking about Opus and you, utilizing technology in creative ways as, as we're facing new challenges and our everyday challenges. And then Alice, a very good friend of mine who's an HR director in our world said to me today, I hired a floor manager and I'm like, I'm so happy, but we should be happy because we struggle with those types of positions. And he said, culinary agents. And by the way, I had a great, great lot of qualified candidates. So I've used culinary agents in my lifetime and I still will, but it was great to hear a success story during these times. It's great to be here. Thank you, Jackie. We didn't even pay you to say that. I know. Thank you for sharing. I think the call's over, right? <laughs> and there's the plugs. Exactly. We got it. Um, well, um, so we're about to dig in um, just a little bit about what we do at Opus, um, which uh, we'll be talking a lot about today is the fact that in the United States, there are 110 million people in the working world who don't sit at a desk all day. And an enormous percentage of them, which I know Alice will be talking about, that uh, do not, uh, uh, do not, um, not only don't sit at a desk all day, but they also work in the hospitality industry across multiple subsectors. Um, these humans are the backbone of the American economy, but it's really hard to train your deskless workforce at scale. 
so that's what we do at Opus is we are the first learning platform that's actually built specifically for your workforce that doesn't sit at a desk all day. Um, so our technology leverages text message to help you reach your people with an interactive training experience uh, that actually yields three times the learning outcomes than a traditional desktop LMS might. Um, so we're gonna be talking a lot about uh, how we can attract, retain, and uh, grow our people today through the lens of recruitment. Um, so I wanna start with some basics here. Uh, Alice, I'm gonna actually let you answer this question. Um, the, uh, the, the person kind of overseeing this whole world right now, um, can you tell us a little bit more about what some of the common misconceptions people have about recruitment in the hospitality industry are? Um, what, when people talk to you about culinary agents, what do you have to correct them on? Yeah, well, that's a loaded question. Let's get started. Um, well, we, you know, we are nationwide. We have about 29,000 businesses that we support. Um, so we do get a variety of perspectives, both large and small. And I think some of the common misconceptions are around um, anyone can do it. Uh, you know, a lot of times, a lot of times, and, and granted it's within con constraints typically of resources and how that business is operating. Um, but we do see um, businesses recognizing that there is a need for a more dedicated uh, person to help with the people function or with all different, there are different aspects of HR and re recruiting and talent sourcing really is, is one aspect of it. And, you know, we do see uh, people kind of fall into those roles sometimes and, and with or without proper training or, or guidance and they kind of figure it out along the way. And sometimes that works out really well. Sometimes it um, adds a little bit uh, more to the process and confusion for that particular business. Um, but I, I, I do think that, you know, anyone can do it is a common misconception. It's easy is another misconception. You know, it, it often ends up being kind of a task that's added onto somebody's, you know, a list at the end of the day or something, you know, uh -huh. you draw straws and that person gets to do it. Um, but it's really something that, especially now more than ever, um, requires more dedicated time uh, and, and, and sometimes more dedicated expertise as well. And I think that's going to continue to evolve. Kiras, Jackie, I'm not sure if you had any, have anything to add to that around misconceptions about recruitment in the hospitality industry. I'm just wondering, the, the, those who had the misconception that it was easy if they worked in the hospitality <laughs> business, because we've never ever felt that it was easy. It was a challenge even before COVID-19, always. Yep. Agree okay, 100%. I don't know, maybe, maybe not, you know, uh, or maybe their mis misperception of, you know, it's easy because, well, anyone can do it. Maybe just hire anyone who's, who's breathing or who shows up. And, you know, I think we all know that that's not the case, especially as, brands and concepts for their develop and they get more specific in the types of people they look for and the types of um, skills that they they have so in my experience actually that misconception even within the the same uh, hospitality company is usually not from operators so a lot of the times when you have to run your restaurant short staffed and we we all know what that leads to right poor customer experience even uh, uh, the workers themselves are not very happy, you're short-staffed, everything uh, slows down, you make more mistakes, and then you have someone sitting in the office, and I happen to be that person nowadays, but in my previous life, you have someone sitting in the office, and it's like, why don't you call someone else? And it's like, I don't have a dry storage full of people, like, you know, people call out, it's not that easy to have replacement, and if you get short-staffed, it's also not that easy to, uh, to hire quickly, and so at least in my experience, it has always been the case. Uh, labor has always been a challenge in, in our industry. Of course. Uh, but uh, yeah, now come to think of it, I can, I can relate it to the misconception. If, if you haven't operated, if you haven't felt it firsthand, then you might think, okay, what's the big deal? Just go hire more people. What's wrong with you? Well, I think that the, a lot of that, what you're saying comes from you, what, how you introduced yourself. Once a crew member, always a crew member. Right. And I think that any of us in a leadership role or in any type of role that supports the front line of the restaurants, we need to have empathy. Right. We need to know what it's like. We can't sit in an office like the Wizard of Oz behind a computer and just think that everything is magically going to come together. Right. Um, 
my not even just on recruiting when i think of it from an hr perspective and any kind of sensitive conversations i always feel comfortable having them because i do have that crew member mentality right first job ever prep cook server for a thousand years um so we know what it's like to be in the trenches with them for sure um but that misconception of it's easy i think when rachel put out our document on asking questions i think that's the first word that came to my mind too People just assume, put up an yeah. ad, put up yeah, an ad. And, <laughs> and I will actually add to that, which is kind of like a, a follow on to the, the, the easy comment, which is um, it's perceived to be easy because word of mouth is such a powerful and real uh, tool that people leverage. And, and that I don't think will ever go away. But I think as, as you all have seen, as, as businesses grow, as teams grow, um, you know, there's just so much word of mouth that comes you know, at the right time, when you need it, uh, with as many people that you need at, at a time, right? So it's kind of like, you can't just, just do one thing. It is mul multiple things that businesses and hiring managers need to think about and work on simultaneously, um, which, you know, all feeds into the overall recruiting process where, you know, it's not just, I need somebody tomorrow, let's go, you know, post a job or let's think about it now. It's, you know, we know that recruiting and and um, turnover is an ongoing challenge for businesses. So how do we approach it so that, you know, when we're ready or when we need, you know, our employer branding is already out there, people are familiar and they want to, you know, jump at the opportunity to work with us. Well, you're bringing, you're all bringing up an important point here, which I think is the next phase of this conversation, which is that, um, you know, beyond the fact that uh, there, so there's sort of like low barriers to entry in the restaurant industry that it's notorious for, but there's also important skill sets that we're hiring people into. And as a part of that process, uh, there are a lot of roles that different managers play in the act of recruiting. Um, in this ideal state, um, and fear us, I'm actually thinking of you right now. What, what we really want as operators is we want our GMs to keep GMing and we want our chefs to keep chefing. But at the same time, they play this really important role in recruitment. Um, beyond just the marketing aspect, beyond drawing in talent, what is the ideal role of our managers that are on the floor right now, running around our busy restaurants? Uh, yeah. And how can we optimize for that? That's a good question. I think that's part of GMing. Recruiting is part of GMing. Uh, now, chefing, I haven't worked in that world in a, in a very long time. But as a general manager, uh, I think your, your number one job is the people. So one, you have to make sure that you're fully staffed. And uh, uh, at a store level, you might not have a, a dedicated recruiting department uh, in the company. Maybe yes, maybe not. But if you do, then, uh, then that department serves as a support function. You are the one that still have to do uh, that. Right. And so, and what does that mean doing the recruiting? It doesn't mean interview and hire only. It means creating a culture in your restaurant that is attractive to the profile of employees that we wanna hire. So if your restaurant is not clean, people are not happy, uh, you know, they're, they're working very, very long hours, you haven't, been successful at creating that culture, and, and that's also part of the, your responsibilities as a GM, then it's going to be harder for you to, to staff. And even if uh, you're lucky enough to hire people, they're not going to last. Uh, you know, you, they're coming in from one door, leaving the, uh, the other. So, so yeah, I 100% I believe that it's part of their responsibilities. I actually think uh, the bigger part is, is on the general managers. Uh, bigger companies, they might lay down the vision, uh, maybe the characteristics, the profile of the employees that we want in our company, and we have to train our GMs to be able to identify that. But I think it's their responsibility to ensure that they're fully staffed with a little bit of buffer, they're creating that culture where people are not leaving uh, and people are happy working uh, with that specific leader. I agree. I believe it's all a team effort for sure. We all play we all play a role in it and every organization has a different structure. I've been lucky to work for employers my entire career that have always, you know, wanted to be employers of choice and, and made environments where people were wanted to work for us. And I think, you know, a chef is the best marketing tool for, for culinary folks, of course. Um, and the GM, he's 
he or she has to be the per like your G to have a great GM, that GM must treat that building, that place, that the feel, the look, the music, the people, like it's their own. And you know, then you have us in HR or talent management or back of house, if you will, or back office as a support system and kind of rolling out programs and supporting. We're all lean and mean right now. Yeah. <laughs> we always say hiring is a team sport. And, it's a team right, sport. Yeah. It's pervasive. It's ongoing. It's the culture. You never know when somebody might be a guest dining and love the experience. And all of a sudden they're your next candidate for host hostess or, or Absolutely. You know, visiting. And it, it's like everyone to be on alert at all times. Um, and even for companies that are larger that have full, you know, headquarters staff, that's, you know, big, robust team and support system. To Ferris's earlier point, you know, sometimes there's a disconnect between the operator and what's happening in headquarters. So you do want to, at the end of the day, um, you know, the, the GMs and the operators uh, to be involved to make sure that the right folks are coming through the door and that they're hiring the, the, the right ones as well, so. And so I wanna talk, the, this setup is actually perfect for I think what a lot of our listeners wanna be engaging with at this moment, which is uh, we're in this uh, new era of work, uh, which is uh, a nicer way of saying post COVID. Uh, we're in a place where um, our operations have changed and uh, restaurants and we're seeing it left and right are experiencing extreme shortages in labor, but there's no lack of talent out there, right? And so what I'd like to do first, before we dig into the solutions, can we talk for a few minutes about what are some of the things that you're seeing around uh, the causes behind that? Um, is there one cause, are there multiple? And I think from my perspective, uh, and, and from some of the conversations we're having, there's a lot of, of things, there's a lot of factors at play here. So I think I wanna do a bit of a, a rapid fire. What are some of the reasons why it's hard to attract talent now in the post COVID world? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, to, to kick that one off. Um, it is a multifaceted, multi-layer. I mean, recruiting, talent sourcing, retention have been you know, challenges that this industry has faced pre-COVID. Um, I think what 2020 brought to the table was just elevated a lot of existing challenges that the industry was kind of working through anyway. Um, it has, uh, you know, one of the main contributors is from a timing perspective, so many businesses were reopening, you know, re, you know restarting delayed projects, opening and high rehiring full staff all simultaneously across all cities, et cetera. So the sheer volume, the sheer demand um, created a gap with supply. Um, you know, our data shows so many, um, you know, thousands and thousands of people looking at the jobs, applying to the jobs, saving the jobs. But what we're seeing and what the data is showing us is that people are a little more thoughtful about taking the next step. So there's so many options, which is also driving delays in people accepting positions or potentially people applying to multiple positions to see, you know, what they can get, which which is a great thing, right? So um, those are those are a couple of, of factors. I think people are just uh, have reevaluated personal priorities and are really looking at employers that can offer them what they're looking for, and and that that's a, a change for the the positive. And it's 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 um, adding insult to industry in injury a little way in a way to businesses because after a year of uncertainty and closures and this that and the other, they're finally able to ramp up and get going. And you know the timing is misaligned with the, the sense of urgency with some of the, the job seekers. I couldn't agree more about the multifaceted. There's a there's a million reasons. Most of them are again part of our roller coaster. Most of them are things that we've seen over and over again during different di different economics, different times. Um, you know, I just read an article in that, that ZipRecruiter did a survey and it said that 35% of people, as opposed to 51% in the past, are taking their first job offer because there, there's less financial pressure. Um, and where does that come from? It, you know, Obviously, unemployment is a conversation that everyone is having. Um, people are having conversations about people being lazy. I don't, I don't love that word. I, I try to believe that there's not as much of that in the world as people are saying, but I do believe people have 
made some changes in their lives due to COVID, whether it was, you know, moving somewhere that was more affordable, um, changing direction, figuring out the family dynamic and, you know, spending more time with children or what, whatever it may be. But it, the financial pressure of having to take a job seems to have shifted. And I think that's definitely a new challenge for us. I've been back on the road um, specifically for our fast casual brand, helping, you know, put team members back in place. Again, I've been very lucky when we reopened, I rehired almost my entire team. Uh, but now that we're extending hours and getting busier, I have some spots. But I, you know, when I drive around where we're located and I look at every other brand, these signs we never seen before, right? We have never, these hiring signs are just, they're massive. And, you know, that could also be a sign of the times. It could also be inflating what the problem actually is to, to the public world, because we've always known it's a problem. We've never ever said, oh, wow, we got all the people we could ever need forever and we'll live happily ever after. Um, so I, I think that the, those are a few things. And then, you know, like Alice said, it's definitely not one thing now and it never was, it never was or will be. And uh, I, I agree 100%. I don't know if I have anything uh, to add, but what I will say is um, it's not an easy job to do. And, and I've done it for, for a very long time and I've managed many, many teams. Uh, our industry is not an easy one, right? And so, uh, you just said it that last year there was a lot of uh, uncertainty. There were businesses that would close, open up, close. Maybe they got a grant, maybe they didn't. Maybe some paychecks were, uh, were a little late. Uh, so I think they had a year of a lot of bad experiences in addition to the job itself not being an easy one. And so I think uh, I mean, this is one of the reasons, but I think there are a lot of people that are taking a couple of steps back and, and thinking about this. Do I really want to go back? And do I, do I want to go back to exactly how it was before? You know, you're paying me eight, nine bucks an hour and I'm standing up for 12 hours and I'm going home, uh, you know, dirty from the grill, burnt up my, you know, so some people are thinking about this. And so uh, not to now, I'll get into the solution, but I think this is part of the reason why uh, why the shortage is uh, is a, a bit wider now than how it was before. Like you said, we've always had it. There was yeah. it was always a change, but it's more accentuated now for sure. Yeah, and I'll also add. I think that you know safety is still a real concern for a lot of people who haven't what? had so access to vaccination. You know, who are you know guest facing and also have the added stress of you know, controlling, you know, how guests behave and, and conduct themselves and, and whatever they need to enforce. So there's like added, uh, you know, risk um, that gets factored into somebody, you know, after they've had, you know, essentially a break from nights, working nights and weekends for the entire time, mm -hmm. right? And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of what this industry offers, especially if you're a tipped employee, et cetera, a lot of the, the attractive, flexible scheduling, um, cash compensation, tips, et cetera, um, you know, weren't really being offered for quite some time. And even to an extent, depending on the city, you know, guests are guests, are guests and they're unpredictable. So, yeah. you know, if you're reduced hours or if your hours get cut or uh, it's not busy and you don't get the tips, then, then, you know, you put yourself in a situation where you risked yourself and it wasn't even you know essentially worth it um to, to certain in, in certain positions and situations um and then i will say the other thing that that kind of came to light a little bit more uh in the past couple of weeks is if you look at the types of people that that typically work in this industry or, or are attracted to it um you know there are the 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 career hospitality folks who are in it they love it you know they they enjoy the grind and they're in it to win it um, and then you have folks who love it for those perks I just mentioned, you know, they, they have the flexibility to pursue, you know, acting or something else while they're able to work, et cetera. And as those other industries open, like I know in Manhattan, I think September Broadway will be opening. I feel like once people start getting back into other aspects of their daily lives, they will go back to or look for the employment 
opportunities that fit into their schedule and will allow them to continue to, to pursue what they want to pursue. I think you're uh, something else to, to add to that, Alice, uh, you're bringing up a good point around like, this is an industry that um, can uh, supports a lot of people who are working part time in the industry. Um, there's also the 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 hard fact around childcare, which is that some parents just can't return to work yet. Um, schools are open and not open and shut down. And so there's so many factors that beyond just uh, compensation that are impacting the decisions that people are making when they're evaluating when and how they like to return to the hospitality industry. Um, so I think that leads us into this next bigger conversation, which is, all right, we've identified all of the potential reasons why we're experiencing this shortage. And honestly, as we all <laughs> know, the shortages or the, the challenges that we've always seen in the hospitality industry. Um, so there, let's talk for, let's specifically focus on the front line. Um, there was a recent Forbes article that reported that training dollars are which is no secret, are disproportionately spent on employees with a college degree or higher. 58% um, is spent on employees with a college degree, 25% with some college, 17% with a high school diploma or less. Um, so the question is, um, now in the world that we're living in, what impact does training and development have on how we attract talent? Uh, what can we do to improve how we advertise? development opportunities. So maybe this is a question for you, Alice. Um, what are some of the ways that we can, uh, if we believe that training and development is an opportunity to attract folks back into uh, tracked careers, what are some ways to, to highlight that? Yeah, I mean, I think training and development, uh, especially in the hospitality industry, depending on the position, and there's so much on the job training, there's so much guidance and mentorship that, you know, I think a lot of job seekers or, or early, you know, entrants really look for, even if they went to culinary school or studied um, and have a degree in hospitality, et cetera. It's that real life experience that, you know, people, I believe, and I, and I know really factor into when they start looking for employment. And am I going to learn from this individual or this team, this company? What do I admire? What do I want to, what do I strive to, you know, do? Um, I think training and development play such a strong role in retention, which is, you know, the other half of the challenge. It's like, you can get all the people and recruit and be great at that. But if you can't retain these, these folks um, and, you know, help them, you know, develop them further so they can be a, of a further asset to your company as you grow, then that kind of adds to this cycle of turnover and training and recruiting, et cetera. Um, so, you know, I, I have seen and, and I think we will see more of, um, you know, we hear from, from workers, we did a survey earlier this year, and, you know, what they're looking for are career growth opportunities, right? And that could potentially go hand in hand with, uh, you know, the year of uncertainty, of job security, of just um, wanting to, to not only learn more themselves so they can be more, you know, new, more valuable to their companies, but also to market themselves, should they be in a position where the job is no longer available to them or they're, they're let go. Absolutely. I just remembered why we were talking about Opus this morning, and it had to do with leadership training and soft skills. And Alice, I'm sure you've heard this a thousand times, right? People getting promoted. And I've asked the question, what were your you were promoted from a crew member to an assistant manager. What was that training process like? And lots of times we hear that that training process was, here are the keys. Here's the code to the safe, um, <laughs> right? Here's your collared shirt as opposed to your t-shirt. Um, but I think that offering the soft skills and the leadership skills and the management, you know, I've always offered any team leader or somebody who was looking to step up into a key holder position you know, an HR 101 boot camp that would teach, talk about interview skills, which is enormous. If you're the person responsible for hiring the people on your team, you should have the tools in your toolbox on how to do that, right? And then, you know, of course, I've always said the more time we spend hiring, the less time we spend firing, which, you know, 
my managers think is a little annoying how often I say it, but it's reality. Uh, but there is firing, right? And giving people the training to have difficult conversations. And I think that that is where we, we want to talk about those training tools in terms of career path, which is, of course, for us, retention, right? Um, I don't think anybody's nailed it perfectly, but Rachel, we were, we were thinking of you this morning, um, one of the our other HR professionals had a, a great idea. And I said, I'm going to team you up with Rachel because I think she might be able to take it to the finish line. Always open to ideas. <laughs> For sure. Great. Well, I think this is a good opportunity to dig in um, specifically to this top of funnel strategy. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about some retention strategies, because it's obviously, um, and I know all of you have been in this field for, for decades now, um, this isn't just about how do I get people through the door, it's also about how do I keep them there. Um, but when we're thinking about recruitment, um, uh, it's 2021, <laughs> are we recruiting in the same way that we always have, um, and in what ways is this changing? Um, so some of the ways that uh, I was always familiar with when I was in the industry was, of course, online platforms, culinary agents is a great example, um, that are, are well exposed and well networked with hundreds of thousands of millions of users. Um, and also on the other side, uh, good old fashioned, uh, really good postings, like we, we used to make sure that anyone who walked through the door was being paid attention to and was getting that interview, that's an opportunity. And the last bit was, um, was different smaller networks, smaller groups. Um, so I'm curious to hear if there's anything in addition to that or any small groups that you can rep recommend, any platforms you can recommend. Of course, we're gonna uh, mention culinary agents here. <laughs> um, Love them. But I, I wanna say this through the lens of the fact that we, and, and of course I'm biased here, but uh, it's a fact that 25% of the hospitality industry doesn't speak English as a first language. So how are we thinking about attracting a multilingual talent across multiple avenues? I think a partnership that I just worked with recently, cause I was, I'm doing some hiring for team members in Maryland market and in you know, New York City, I have all of you and I have so, so much of a vast network, but going in to different markets, you can use your tried and true methods, but you have to be creative. I just recently joined the Maryland Hospitality Alliance, right? I, Andrew and the New York City Hospitality Alliance are near and dear to my heart, but they're, that's not necessarily who's going to give me a great, great ideas on functions and just overall job fairs and things that are happening in the area. So I think you know, knowing to use different resources in different markets and, you know, not, not, not siphon the, the one method again, like we talked about earlier with using different methods. But as far as your question of how has it changed? I mean, other than social media and instant gratification and constant, you know, interactions, I, I don't really think it has changed that much. I, you know, I still believe I make the best connections by sending out, you know, a group text or a group email to my people and saying, here, help me. And, you know, the HRPIH group is a great example of that. And also, you know, I come from a school of we're in this together, this hospitality world, right? I can't tell you how many times I interviewed someone and they walked out the door and I said, gee, that person just isn't going to work here. And I picked up the phone and called a friend at another restaurant group and said, look at this person on LinkedIn. They'll be a great fit for your restaurant. And, and we all still do that. I think uh, what I would like to add to that is uh, one practice that uh, has been successful with me was uh, employee referrals. So our own frontline employees uh, referring yeah. uh, uh, their friends, uh, uh, and we gave them a bonus uh, if we ended up hiring the person. But uh, this ties into the importance of training, which is uh, uh, which is important not only for the confidence of the employees, but training is a big pillar in terms of creating a good culture within your company and within your restaurant. So when you have a great culture, not only are your employees super happy to be working in that environment, but they don't stop talking about it. And I've seen this firsthand. Everywhere they go, they talk about it and people are like, I really wanna join. 
And you start getting these phone calls, hey, a friend of mine, my roommate wants to join, etc. And you add in a, a little bit of bonus to that. Uh, I think that's uh, in addition to all of the other recruiting efforts uh, can be very helpful. Yeah, I'll add that, you know, you guys are confirming the earlier point where I said, you know, word of mouth is always going to be and, and referrals are always going to be there. And still, I, I think even to this day, you know, one of the most um, successful ways of finding um, uh, folks, um, the, uh, the thing that I've seen change is that businesses are embracing technology, uh, you know, differently. I think, uh, everybody is kind of on stage. It's not just, you're, like I mentioned, you're, everyone's recruiting all the time. Your chef puts something on Instagram and a, a young you know, student at the CIA sees it and, and loves it and all of a sudden is excited to potentially work with this person. You know, The difference is you as an employer need to make it as easy as possible for that interested potential candidate to either submit their resume or connect with someone so they can get into a pipeline or get on somebody's radar, right? So. And leveraging different tools and different channels um, that are available to both, you know, headquarters and operators, um, and recognizing that everyone's influencing the overall. You're always kind of selling your company culture to the next, uh, the next candidate, the next worker. You never know who's who's looking and who's interested. So, um, for us, you know, from a technology standpoint, because we're dedicated to this industry, we can examine each aspect very closely, build relationships with schools, different types of schools, um, vocational programs, uh, industry specific organizations, et cetera, to try to build these additional connections to make it easier for our employers to get access and get exposure, right? If you, uh, if you can't be found, you don't exist, right? That's Google's famous saying. And um, you don't wanna get to the point where uh, you, know, you have to rely on posting the job only, right? It has to be, well, we know that we have this image, this brand, um, and, uh, you know, now we're, we need some additional folks that so we're, we're going to use the tools that we have to kind of project that and advertise it even further. You know, you're bringing up something um, around, I have two questions for all of you. Uh, Alice, you're mentioning this, this, this great modernization that's happening. And I think a conversation that I had just yesterday with an operator was they said, um, th it's a multi-unit restaurant group. And they said, we are seeing more and more young people uh, coming through the doors who are, start who are expecting more modern practices and more modern technology. They are demanding it. And so that means the technology has to be slicker. It means that job descriptions have to be inclusive. It means that bonuses have to be meaningful. Um, and I'm curious to hear if um, there's anything else that uh, you're thinking about as far as the modernization of the recruitment process. This question is for all of you, of course. And the second question is, I want to hear dollars. What is the going rate for a referral bonus <laughs> these days for a frontline position and a management position? I think I could say as far as the referral bonuses goes, it's, it's a competitive market out there. I'm not always a big, big fan of frivolous bonuses. I'm not, I'm, I'm a little bit more conservative with those. Uh, but I heard somebody say today that I was speaking to a good friend who was an operator in a, in a large restaurant group. And she said to me that they were doing a referral bonus that paid on the spot for the referral. So the person came in and filled out that application. They paid out the bonus that day, which is definitely different from what normally traditionally you hear after 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. And I said, wow, I want to hear more about that. And what she said was, yeah, we paid for the referral. It's our job to make the hire. It's our, our job to onboard and train and make this person and then deal with retention. So I think it's definitely um, competitive, interesting, and people are getting, I don't know if it's generous, crazy, or creative, or maybe all of the above. You have companies paying uh, candidates just to show up for interviews. So uh, all rules went out the window uh, since COVID. So. Uh, but I think it depends what companies can afford. I mean, uh, I've paid out $50 bonuses and it worked out great. When I worked with Chipotle, we paid $150. So it depends what you can afford and it depends on the need as well. Again, 
you have companies paying you just to show up for an interview today. So. Yeah, we ha we've had, um, you know, sticking on to this referral piece, um, you are seeing right now, especially in the past couple of weeks, um, you know, people starting the title of their job posting with, you know, $500 signing bonus, wow. basically, you know, kind of kind of like a banker. Um, so we, we absolutely are seeing, you know, both referral bonuses internally, um, some businesses pay a little bit more for a management position versus an hourly position. Um, we're seeing hiring bonuses um, that are, you know, pre, like you get hired, you get your bonus. And then we see the bonuses that are paid out after, you know, 60, 90 days. So after probation um, and, the, and the, the dollar amounts have varied from $500 to um, $1,000 to $2,000 I've seen. Um, so, uh, and I'm sorry, I actually forgot the first part of your question because we went right into the- bonus. Well, yeah, we're going, we're, I'm just like fascinated by, by all of this because some things have changed. <laughs> some things have not. Um, when I was in the front line, a $50 bonus was, was pretty normal. And I had to wait 60 days for that person to be <laughs> working there. Um, but uh, the, the first question was around the modernization of hiring practices. Um, what are some things that we're seeing that are different than uh, what we were doing in the practices uh, 10 years ago that uh, are either because it's a, there's a lot of young people who are uh, from a different generation who are entering the workforce or for other reasons? I, I think the one thing that I've seen both gradual and then more immediate in the past you know, year or so is this, this um, pushing kind of the culture to the forefront, which is um, featuring your leaders, talking about, you know, how your general manager started as a busser and after years have become. And so it, it's kind of pushing more people on the team into the spotlight, which, which I believe um, also resonates with certain folks who are, um, who, who are looking for that potential to get recognized and, and also at the same time, the business is sending the message that we hire from within. If you, you know, if you give us your all, we will, we will, you know, reciprocate. Um, and you know, kind of really pushing their own teams out as you know, success stories, if you will, as part of the overall um, recruiting process. So this kind of acknowledgement of uh, this overall, like it is a team effort. It's not just the excuse me. <clears throat> it's not just the chef. It's not just an individual, you are joining a team who will value you, who will recognize your contributions and who will reward you, whether not necessarily monetarily because some businesses don't have the means to do that, but will will train you, will promote you, will put you on a pedestal. And potentially those things could help you succeed in your next step in your career, right? So um, a lot of um, younger folks are also looking for resume building opportunities. And, and whether that be, again, back to learning on the job, working for specific names or businesses and um, putting you know, experiences under their belt uh, and then using that to try to progress. And you know, that's, that's part of, um, part of you know, career path and progression. And, and you know, I think that that's great. And you want somebody with that type of, of drive to, to move forward as well. Um, but yes, from a technology standpoint, you know, I think, I think a lot of the uh, the additional side work and practices or inefficiencies that can be addressed by using technology, I feel like are welcomed in the more you know modern in the modernization process, um, because you know everyone wants to get back to focusing on the guests, to get back to focusing on the business and their craft and all that. Um, so the the less a business is willing to change or adopt. Um, efficiencies and technology and, and different practices, then essentially the more work is created or the more additional and side work is created for that, that individual. And, um, you know, that sometimes, especially for folks who are entering the industry, it may just seem like inefficiencies that, you know, add to the, the, the list of things that they have to do. The one thing I want to add is, in my opinion, and I'm the end user, right? So I'm the guy that would be using the tools necessary to recruit. I'm not a recruiter. I didn't see much modernization in the past 10 years. I think the tools that I have used 10 years ago, uh, very similar is what, is what we're using today. So applications are done online. The onboarding is done, is digitized. Um, I think technology might be lagging a little bit when it comes to recruiting, 
or maybe I need to do more of my own homework and find out uh, what's out there. <laughs> Sure, we'd love to. You guys are doing something that wasn't done ten years ago. Ten years ago is right. It's two thousand and eleven, but yeah, I would love to hear it. But in my experience, uh, at least it wasn't. It's not as flagrant as uh, operations, as an example. Like today, you can automate operation and leverage technology where you almost don't even need a district manager. Almost like you can leverage uh, technology in terms of automating audits or automating uh, a lot of the things that. Previously, you had to send someone, and only maybe four or five years ago, you couldn't do it unless someone was in the premises. Uh, when it comes to recruiting, I, I, I personally haven't seen much. I want to I want to agree with Firas a little bit without getting Alice upset because you got you guys do it really well. You really do. Uh, but as the as the HR person, you know, sometimes we don't have those great tools as a separate ATS. And we rely on our payroll um, software that calls themselves an HRIS also. And it can be a little frustrating to us, the end user. And again, because I've been doing this so long, I haven't seen great strides. There have been changes and enhancements. But what I do see, and I think that is what answers Rachel's question, is the expectation from the new hire. They want a seamless process. They want it to happen instantly. Um, and they, they just want to, you know, be able to do it on their phone with, with one hand and, and on their way home. Right. So I definitely think, and again, like Alice, you guys do it great. You know, there are some other products out there that are really great. I think if we could ever find that one solution that would fit all of this, it will be a miracle. I don't know if that's ever happening, but on the onboarding side for the end user, I kind of agree with Gareth pretty much. Uh, but I do think we, the expectation of the new hire is our responsibility to manage because there is that moment when you hire them is so critical and making sure that onboarding experience is as flawless and, as can be because that's where you're really representing yourself. And that's their, that's their first day on the job, right? If I have an orientation, which I've been doing via Zoom and the technology doesn't work, or if I send, that just happened to me, I just sent somebody a rehire checklist from our payroll provider and she got locked out of the system. You know, her, her experience was not a red carpet experience. Um, and that, that's what I think is definitely missing. Um, it has changed though, uh, but I'm kind of with Virus. The past 10 years, maybe not so much. Yes, but the 10 years, because before That's a good number. On by, I don't know if you guys remember, by paper, you have to keep those papers. I mean, it was, it was brutal. It got yeah. digitized, and then since then, uh, I, I don't know if it uh, changed much, uh, but I want to focus on the recruiting piece, not even the onboarding. So once you hire them, uh, there are a lot of tools that do onboarding really well. But in terms of recruiting, you post a job somewhere, you boost it and it'll post everywhere. And then you get candidates. Beyond that, I haven't seen much uh, technology, but I would love to connect and learn more. Alice, I'm about to tee you up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I want to tee this up only because I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this, is that something that we're seeing in the tech world right now, especially with hospitality tech or food tech, whatever hashtag you want to use, is something that we're calling the great unbundling where you have your traditional HRIS uh, that is sort of uh, positioned as your do-it-all platform. But the problem is, is that um, they're, they're only experts at one thing. And then they sort of tack on all these other subpar technologies. <laughs> and that's why tools that are specific for recruitment and, and hiring like culinary agents, um, I think we're starting to see a lot more of that. Um, where you have more sophisticated technology solving one core problem really beautifully. Now, who's to say what's going to happen in another 10 years when it all bundles up again? But Alice, I'm curious to hear if that's something that you're seeing also. Absolutely. I always say, you know, find your core competency, do that really well, focus on developing and making that even better. Uh, and then partner with and integrate the other best in class technology. When you see you know, I may offend some some technology technologists out there, but um, my background is technology. I spent 13 years at IBM. Um, so 
when you see a company that says they can do everything and, you know, but they're really like one, one specific area, I, I would ask a lot of questions, right? And, and be weary because being able to do something versus being able to do it well are very, very different things. Um, sure, could, you're, could, you, could you put your cook as a server position? Absolutely, they can do it. But is that their core competency? No. Um, and so from a technology standpoint, I would say there, there is an unbundling and then there will be a consolidation. Um, I think HR tech, backend systems, not just HR, but, but since that's this, this topic, um, backend tools for restaurants, um, we're kind of an afterthought. And for the past 10, 15 years, you've seen so many new, which is great, new businesses coming in to try to disrupt and trying to fix what the incumbents have essentially had a stronghold and, and gave operators no choice, right, for so many years. And then you see the disruptors come in and they are trying to break things um, and do it better and show and prove to both operators as well as these large technology companies that you need to specialize and do, do an area well. Um, and then you can either fold it into your, your broader systems um, or you, know, you can try to sell yourself as like an all end-to-end -end solution. Um, but you know, a lot of applicant tracking systems track your applicants. They're not really great at helping you source them or, they're, or marketing your employer brand or attracting and selling your brand to, you know, uh, to to the right audience, right? You know, a lot of job distribution companies focus on clicks. Well, great, you know, they don't care who's clicking on it. They got you the click, so pay for the click, right? And it's like, um, so it's it's this, this this thing that we're seeing where I, while I'm very happy that there's more focus and more development and more recognition that these tools need to be further developed and focused on, it's, it's doing great for us because it's highlighting the fact that us always being specialized in hospitality and folding in the nuances of, of you know, all the special things that this industry needs. <laughs> um, you, know, you really have to understand the nuances and, you know, and, and the operator pains and what the challenges are for, for both sides to be able to address them. Um, so there's a lot of technology tools that, that do what they do really well. And I can applaud them for recognizing the need to uh, go upstream or downstream to further develop their offerings to try to help their clients and maybe upsell or cross sell and all those good things that technology companies do. Um, but inevitably, um, you want to ask them the hard questions. If you have a payroll company that says, great, now we have an ATS for you. Okay, well, what job distribution companies is your ATS partner with? Where are my jobs going to be put? Out of which one of those distribution channels am I going to get my hospitality audience? Do mm -hmm. they work with the right schools? How do I get exposure in these specific areas, right? Um, and so I would say, you know, while I think it's it's great, I'm very excited because you know, it's actually pushing us more into the forefront, um, and it, it's it's a timely it's timely. You know, this is such an interesting an important mm -hmm. topic, but the tools have been underinvested in and they've been very complicated. And it's gotten to the point where sometimes businesses are, are even, you know, every time they hear we have this new tool or we have this new feature, they just see dollar signs and they don't even want to, you know, go near it because it can be, it can be sold as this bundled package. But then when you go to implement it, you realize like, it doesn't really work that way. <laughs> and, uh, and oh, by the way, it's still not getting you what you need. And you still have to post on, you know, culinary agents or another mm -hmm. site to get the, the visibility. So this is uh, leading to uh, the, the final stage of our conversation here where everyone is um, magically has a crystal ball in front of them and talks about the ideal state of the world. Um, I want to hear it. I think we all have seen this industry backwards and forwards from different angles, and I'm curious to hear um, any predictions you have for the coming year when it comes to the state of recruitment in the hospitality industry. Thumbs up, thumbs down, stays the same, uh, and then we're going to go really far. <laughs> uh, maybe, Jackie, we can start with you. I, I've been saying for the past year and a half that my crystal ball was broken. <laughs> my boss told me that the, the week COVID happened. Our, our crystal ball is broken. I say thumbs up. I, I'm very optimistic. I'm very hopeful. I, I see great things ahead. 
Um, I'm going to use your, I like unbundling. I think I'm going to try that for sure. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of work ahead of, ahead for us. Um, but I think that this industry overall is so resilient and such fighters and the passion is there. And I think that everything that's happened has definitely made more awareness of just how everything all of us do interacts with each other. And again, you know, to get back to food and service, which is what we do, we need to have amazing food and incredible service. And the rest is logistics. Eros, what does your crystal ball say for the next year when it comes to hospitality and recruitment? Yeah, I would say a thumbs up definitely on, on many aspects and uh, I'll keep it very brief, but when COVID-19 first hit, right, it shook the industry to, the, to its core because a lot of restaurants uh, did not incorporate tech. They, uh, you know, when they heard Ghost Kitchen, they were like, ooh, they, they didn't want to hear about that. There are some companies that, like with Reef Technology, as an example, when COVID-19 hit, we, we, at least in the kitchen side, we didn't feel it. Our sales actually quadrupled. Uh, it was like the best proof of concept that you're doing the right thing. And then a year later, a lot of the restaurants, typical restaurants have one or two virtual brands in their kitchen that you don't know of, right? But they have them, either uh, brands that they created or brands that they just uh, operate. Uh, everybody understands the importance of technology right now. And one thing that uh, is actually, uh, I think very positive, a lot of the companies are increasing their internal minimum wage uh, because they understood uh, we didn't pay that much uh, as an industry and uh, you know we can hide behind the uh, usual excuse of a few increased labor costs uh, well my business is not going to thrive well you got to change your business model you can't you have to be able to pay your people a little bit more and think of uh, of the smart ways of how you can fix your unit economics so yes i think positive i think we're going to pay people a little more we're going to leverage technology a little more and uh, there's a need out there. So I'm excited to see everything else that's going to be invented uh, for this industry. I think it's going to be an exciting year, honestly. Absolutely, I'm gonna agree and double thumbs up. Um, I, I think that you know the forced, quite frankly, the forced technology adoption that happened last year where businesses really started embracing things that they never had on their roadmaps. Um, and now are recognizing that they've they have new revenue channels. They can reach guests a different way and still, you know, maintain their uh, their service level and, and their experience. Um, and so, from an opportunity standpoint, both from the business side and from the worker side, um, there are different types of positions that um, I think will be emerging um, businesses again who have embraced you know, a retail aspect or a to-go or delivery and all these other things are looking for different skills and different people, different positions will open up um, to support this. And, um, you know, I, I think short sure, technology, you, you see like the robotic bartender, all that. I mean, I think it's, you know, fine to experiment with that, but I, I don't think that people will re be replaced in this industry anytime soon at a, at a large scale. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, I think, still at the core of hospitality. Um, and I think that it's not going to happen overnight. You know, I think the industry will continue to evolve this year and into the next and, uh, and things will continue to gradually come back and, and there will be a lot of changes, both in business practices, operations, how, how uh, people are compensated, what they're offered, uh, benefits, and, you know, as Jackie mentioned, you know, very resilient and, and they will figure out what works, works best within their means to attract the talent that they that they need. And, and workers will, will come back to it because there's like a center of gravity that pulls people back <laughs> to this industry. <laughs> I've been trying to get out of it for 20 years and I keep, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, I couldn't agree more with all of you. I feel very optimistic about the next year and the years to come. Um, However, I do think that there are changes happening. And so it will be interesting to see what those changes are, whether it's technologically speaking, whether it's culturally speaking, um, systemically, uh, systematically, 
when it comes to the the all everything that we're seeing around the opportunities to shift and grow in the industry, um, it seems like the moment is now and people are talking about it. We're on a call talking about it right now. Um, so uh, certainly it feels like there's another pivot among us <laughs> in some ways, but um, I, you know, we've all used this word resilient and I think it's because we all are, are very acutely aware of that. That's a word that beautifully describes the industry. Um, so, uh, with that in mind, and I think we already kind of touched upon, uh, the next year and perhaps the, the decade to come, um, I want to end with a fun little question I like to ask everyone, uh, which does not have to be hospitality related. I think our viewers would like to get to know all of you as the humans beyond the screen. Um, what's the last thing that you read that you couldn't put down, uh, whether it was a book or an article or a magazine or a show that you... Uh, like to hate watch, uh, everyone's aching to know. <laughs> uh, Firas, do you want to start? Well, I'm waiting for the Friends reunion. I think that's uh, next <laughs> week. So I'm not missing that. But uh, the last thing I read is Love is Free, Guac is Extra by Monty Moran. He's the co-CEO, ex-CEO -CEO of Chipotle. Uh, and it just, I know I'm very nostalgic of that golden era. I started with Chipotle as a crew member, uh, felt the culture. So it was really nice, like reading the behind the scenes and the thought behind creating that culture. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the last book that I've read. Alice? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so it's funny that you asked this, because I recently just moved like last week and I realized I have so many books and I'm like, oh, this is the pile that I've been meaning to read. Um, I, you know, I, I read my my industry news, of course, you know, Eater and Bloomberg, New York Times. I feel like a lot of those snippets really take up most of my reading capacity these days. Um, the last book I read, um, which is quite a while ago, is Shoe Dog, which is the, the story of Nike, uh, Phil Knight, uh, which is kind of an entrepreneurial journey. Um, it was kind of fun, fun to read. I, you know, kind of reflect back from uh, starting culinary agents and, and kind of going through the early stages of like trying to change behavior and telling people that this is going to be this is interesting you need to focus on it um, but but other than that I mean any any kind of interesting articles that that come my way um, in our easy quick read. Jackie? Unpacking the books was interesting for me too and I, I do have a file that I haven't read and I I haven't re I, I was an avid reader for years and years and years. And I, I think technology has changed that for me very much so with the snippets, as you said. I The New York Times morning briefing is my go-to every single day. In fact, one of my HR director friends forwarded me the one today because it was talking about recruiting in our industry and she knew about this conversation. Um, it's about misconceptions in it too. So you should all definitely read it. Um, but I, I'm looking forward. Both those books you mentioned sound great. Um, watching, it's baseball season. I'm a, I'm a Yankee fan. I was at Yankee Stadium briefly this morning, so I'm super excited. First no-hitter since 1999 last, last night. Um, so I definitely look forward to it. And, and mentioning the Friends reunion, I, I, I saw some snippets on it today. So I'm definitely looking forward to it. And I, was, I stayed in a, t in a terrible hotel last night that didn't have a smart TV. Oh, and I wound up watching some old Seinfeld episodes. So there you go. That's a New Yorker. <laughs> Did New Yorker tried and true, Jackie. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I uh, might have to go on a Netflix break for the next 15 months because I'm pretty sure I watched every single show on Netflix that you could possibly watch throughout lockdown. <laughs> What was your favorite? There's a question for you. Oh gosh, I feel like I rewatched everything. Um, and uh, and then my co-founder introduced me to all of the really terrible action films out there. So I watched The Avengers for the first time. I'm like <laughs> way behind in the times, which was great. So, um, so I'm getting into really fun, but uh, all of the movies I missed out on, I guess in the last decade, um, but The Avengers was very good. Um, so, uh, well, let's uh, wrap up our conversation with, uh, I want to wrap up with a, a huge um, 
just thank you and, and deep gratitude for all of you, not only for joining me today here on our fireside chat, um, Opus is looking and, and always continues to try to bring together people from different perspectives who can think about how we're solving these problems around uh, the front line in the hospitality industry and beyond. And the three of you are people who I respect very much. So thank you so much for being here as experts in the field, but also just as humans and friends who, who I love and deeply admire. Um, Alice Chang, CEO and founder of Culinary Agents, Viras Luati, COO of Hospitality Capital Partners, and Jackie McMahon Oliveri. Uh, director of People and Talent at Bobby Flay's Restaurant Group, uh, and uh, so, and president of HRPIH. So, uh, thank you all very much. Such a lovely time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.